All right, folks, uh, I'm back, at least for this one. Uh, and this is going to be different because uh, you'll notice I'm not responding to anything. Well, not anything specific. It's more I'm just going to be talking for a little bit. And it's something that I've, kind of, I've talked about, I've tweeted about, I've written about, uh, ranted about more than once. And while originally... I was going along with what my mother called it, the all about me disease. It's really, in my mind, the more I think about it, it is a conscious culture of ambivalence. Basically, no one cares about anything but themselves. No one cares about anything but their own world, their own small little part of where they are. Uh, you see it daily. You see someone parked across two spots. You see someone parked in a handicapped spot when they're not. You see them leave uh, shopping carts in just all over the lot. You see them cut in line. All of these things. And I've talked about it, and, you know, I've had people say, get over it. I've had people say, don't be so thin-skinned. I've had other things where I will tell a story and someone will outright accuse me of lying. And you know what? I honestly couldn't care less. Uh, because this is, for me, this is trying to reach the few people who will actually listen and care. And, yes, you can see, I'm actually smoking. And for those who follow me on Twitter, you'll remember that I've made a couple of dietary changes. Uh, I was never a big drinker. Uh, you know, a beer here and there, a glass of wine with dinner, whatever. But my doctor has noticed that I'm getting more uh, psoriatic instances. I'm getting more just regular rashes and things like that. And any amount of yeast is going to affect the body. Uh, even just eating bread will do it. So while I haven't cut all bread, I have completely cut any form of alcohol, and that includes cough syrup, uh, out of my diet on my doctor's orders, he said, let's try this. Uh, just the little bit you, you your body's used to, let's get rid of it. And I'm, I'm three weeks, uh, and my allergies are a little bit better. I am seeing fewer skin things. So he did tell me that while I am working on quitting smoking and also laying down sodas, he said, you know, if you shock your body like that, you could have problems. So he said, you know, continue weaning down the cigarettes, continue weaning the sodas, but don't just drop. Uh, for a few weeks. So starting in a couple of days when I hit uh, a full three weeks, I'm going to basically try giving this up cold turkey. I don't think I'll have a problem because I'm down to like two or three a day. And even those two or three, they sit and they burn and I'll puff on them a little bit. So I'm hopeful that in another several days, I will say that I've not had a cigarette in, in more than 24 hours, and if I can go 48 to 72, chemically it's gone. Uh, and then it's down to sodas, which is a 37-year habit for me with Dr. Pepper, so that one's going to be hard to lay down. But I saw a couple of things today that really kind of drove home how this Conscious ambivalence, this all about me syndrome, whatever you want to call it, seems to be getting worse. Uh, for anyone who's on Twitter or even uh, on Imager, as I saw it there, you'll remember seeing a story about a young lady who, in a grocery store, opened a half gallon of ice cream, licked the top, closed it back up, put it back in the freezer. She's now facing jail time. <laughs> There's another video going around of what I would assume is a girl, but I don't know, uh, based on clothing and such. But we see another person open a bottle of mouthwash, gargle with it, spit back in the bottle. We see another person spitting into a gallon of tea and closing it up, putting it back on the shelf. This is literally, in my mind, the attitude of the world is mine. I can literally do what I want. We've seen it ramping up in other ways, where people who don't like the fact that a private group invited a speaker to a private function, which they were not invited to at all, assaults people, telling them, your group will conform to my standards. 
in the last couple of weeks, we saw a riot in Portland where people had supposed milkshakes with what they believe was quick dry cement in them thrown at them, or an older man who was assaulted with a tire iron. This is the attitude of, I am in charge. I run the world. I am God. And it has to stop. Honestly, it does. And it's not really a new thing. For those who live in the South, especially uh, Texas, North Texas specifically, you'll know the name Ethan Couch. Uh, As a young man, under 21, he was driving while extremely drunk, struck and killed someone. He was basically adjudicated to not to have been raised to where he didn't know the difference between right and wrong and was let off with a slap on the wrist. Later, while on parole or probation, he fled to Mexico and came back. His mother was enabling all this. And people actually, there were people who didn't see a problem with him basically getting a slap on the wrist for murder. Okay, vehicular manslaughter. May not have been premeditated, but he drove drunk and killed someone and he didn't go to jail for nearly as long as he should have. But this is not uncommon for a lot of people. I'm 42, okay? I'm not old, but I'm not young. Uh, Unfortunately for me, I did not go to college right out of high school. I thought, I don't need it. I'm going to get a job. And I did. I had a good job in 95. Retail management. Bought a new car. Got a pager, showing my age there. Got a credit card. Ended up uh, canceling the pager because my my job gave me one, but got more credit cards, took out more debt, and eventually didn't have that job anymore, and then had to work two jobs to pay off what I had and stay afloat. Now, fast forward 10 years later to 2005, and I had bounced all over the place. So after, after a layoff, a reduction in force in late 2004, and the company took really good care of me. I mean, they were merging with another company who was going to be moving jobs out of state. So my original company and the one they were merging with both paid me six weeks of salary. So I walked away with three months of my salary. They were covering my insurance for six months. So I could do nothing for eight weeks, and then start looking for a job, and I'm fine. Now, it happened to be at the end of October, so I took a a road trip out to East Texas to help stump for Louis Gilmert. We actually unseated Max Sandlin, an incumbent Democrat, in Tyler, which was unheard of. We got Louis elected. I came back. I was having lunch with my parents, and I was getting very close to having to move out of my apartment, and I was feverishly looking for a job that would let me either keep my apartment or get another one somewhere else. And my parents both looked at me and said, listen, you've wanted to go back to college for a couple of years. Move home, drive pizza, go to college. I was 28 years old. You know, I was out on my own. I didn't want to, but I wanted that college degree. So I did. And spring 2005, I went back to college. And I was at a local community college. And in my third semester there, I'm taking economics, uh, standard, regular economics. And one of our assignments was basically a compare and contrast of socialism, capitalism, and I forget the other one. Uh, But basically, well, communism versus socialism versus capitalism. Basically, we were debating this. And we were going back and forth, and we realized we'd really come up with a good compare and contrast. So then we look at our next assignment, which is supply side versus Marxist versus Dickensian economics. Dickensian being Charles Dickens. Uh, And as we get into Marx versus Charles Dickens versus supply side economics, we start getting heckled and insulted and threatened by someone who wasn't even in our class. Now, I'm not a small person. I haven't been since my junior year in high school, I'm six foot one. Uh, at the time, I was about 225. And having been banned, uh, having played sports, run track, having uh, four coaches who'd been in the military, having been ROTC, I don't slouch. 
I sit straight, I walk straight, I stand straight. So, when someone my size stands up, shoulders back, and looks straight at you, you, you get a an almost amplified sense of their size. And I'll admit, I use that to my advantage. If someone bows up to me, uh, then I'm not going to back down. Now, I'm of the Mr. Miyagi school of thought when it comes to fighting. Someone always gets hurt. In fact, when I was taking Taekwondo, my sensei took it a, further, a step further and said, normally, everybody gets hurt. So, this idiot just wouldn't back down, even after all of us had told him, dude, we're trying to study for economics class, leave us alone. So, eventually, he starts, like, stomping around. I get up, I get in his path, and he almost runs into me, and I look him square in the face, and I say, you are causing problems. We're doing a class assignment. You need to walk away. I turn to go sit down, and he grabs my arm. Now, I'm not the kind of person who screams, don't touch me, or I don't like to be touched. I don't react well to aggressive physical contact, but I will just slap the hand away, give you a don't mess with me glare, and try to walk away again. And he grabbed my arm again. At this point, I'm visibly upset. So I get right up in his face and I say, touch me again and you'll regret it. He grabs my arm again. I've taken Taekwondo. I've worked for law enforcement, even though I have found very quickly in that job I'm not a cop. I know some submission holds. The bent arm bar, the classic cop hold, where they take your arm and put it behind your back. It's easy to get someone into. I put him in that. And I have my knuckles buried in the clavicle notch, what my mother used to call the teacher muscle. It's where you can get a hold of somebody and they'll do whatever you want. Now, I'm doing this, and by the time I even start putting him in the bent arm bar, a campus cop starts rushing over because she sees what's going on. She gets there. He's screaming that he wants me arrested. He wants me put in jail. He wants me kicked out of college because I assaulted him. Now, she's not to us yet, so I put a little pressure on the shoulder. He screams. I lean in. You're on camera. You touched me first. You assaulted me. Calm down, and they might just suspend you and nothing more. <laughs> she gets there, takes over the hold, marches him off to campus PD. I never heard anything back until she says, He's been expelled. He is now barred from the campus. If you see him again, consider him a threat. Never saw him again. You almost never see people like that again. They don't want a fight when they realize they're outclassed or they're at least matched. And I get people who say, oh yeah, big tough man, that they don't believe it. But I don't like to fight. I had someone, not too long ago, bow up. I got right in their face and I said, here's the deal. You can do this. Both of us are going to get hurt. Both of us are going to bleed. Both of us will be in a lot of pain, but I'll make sure you're in more whenever you're ready. He walked away. It's simple psychology. Whenever someone with this person-centric worldview, that they are the center of the universe, they can do literally whatever the hell they want, get away with it, and no one can even blink at them because of it, whenever they're faced with someone who won't back down, they turn into the coward they are. Look at the videos where you see Mountain Man. And he's at one of these where the cowards in masks who call themselves anti-fascists and use Nazi propaganda where they're riding and someone takes a swing at him. He introduces the guy to the ground with a single punch, knocked out, picks up the expandable baton, and people run from him. He didn't back down. He proved that he's going to make them pay dearly if they wish to assault him. And they run. Now, of course, they have the media and the Democrats on their side. The media and the Democrats, whenever they can, cry about violence not being the answer. And had there not been video of this person trying to swing a, an expandable baton, a piece of steel, at this man's head, prompting him to defend himself, they would have just been screaming and crying about him assaulting a protester. 
They can't in that case because there's video that this person is literally trying to do him serious bodily harm, and he has to react. But where does this mindset come from? And the mindset comes very simply from society. You see, 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, when I was in elementary and middle and high school, we didn't get told you get participation trophies. Yes, there were things where you got a participatory ribbon. These were things like the science fair or independent study where you would study something and you had the stupid little cardboard that stood up and you made a display. You got the participation ribbon so you could take it back to your teacher to show them you show that you did it. So you got your grade. But that was it. There was no everybody gets a trophy. There was none of this, you've won the last four times. You're now disqualified so everyone has a chance. There was none of this. If someone busted their hump and they won every time, they won every time. When you had athletic competitions, there was none of this, okay, everybody who won last time, you're disqualified so everybody else has a chance in a race. The people who worked, the people who trained, did better. And the people who didn't were told, work harder next time. Train harder and you'll be better. It's very simple. That's what they were told. And I didn't like hearing it any more than anyone else did. But I didn't go running to my parents crying about how they made me feel bad because they told me I needed to work harder to win. My parents would have said the same thing. Yeah, you do. When I got an F on a test or when I got a zero for not turning in homework, my parents didn't go scream at the teacher, how dare you fail my child? My parents got upset with me. Why didn't you study? Why didn't you turn it in? We didn't have this culture of we can't hurt feelings or we can't offend people. And, you know, we weren't trying. People weren't trying to hurt your feelings. They weren't trying to offend you. They were holding you to the same standard as everyone else in the class or everyone else at work. That's the way it is. We have now a brand new generation of adults who's been told, oh, it doesn't matter if you don't show up, you still pass. It doesn't matter if you don't turn it in. They just You won't get a grade, but it's not a zero, so it won't make you worse. Now, they're going to be going into the workforce. They're entering adult life with a mindset of, if it makes me feel bad, it is bad, and you can't do that. And they're going to have a horrible time because for the next 20 to 30 years, you're still going to have people from my generation running the show. Your managers won't be 18-year-olds you went to college with or high school with who believe the same as you. Your managers will be 15 to 20 years older than you. And they will have been the ones raised to say, no, you, I tell you your shift is 10 o'clock, you be here at 10 o'clock. Not show up at 1045 because, well, traffic was bad and I just stayed home and waited. Or, you know, I didn't get enough sleep last night, man, so I just needed to sleep in. I, I got here by noon. No, there ain't none of that. And, you know, I worked in retail management several times until I graduated college. And one of them back at the same place I worked for in 95, in Photo Lab. And I had someone, and you know the dress code? Very, very clear. Khaki pants, well, khaki or black slacks. They could not be ripped or torn or faded or stained. Polo shirt that was provided by the company, and since I was in the Photo Lab, a white smock. Hair trimmed. Men could wear beards, but they had to be well trimmed. You know, even this would not have passed muster. He showed up, holes all over his jeans, stains all over his shirt, no smock, hair everywhere, two days worth of growth. I sent him home. Showed up the next day, same thing. I sent him home. Showed up the third day. I wrote him up and I said, you've had three warnings. I am sorry, but I have to let you go. I had it all documented. I actually had video from the three days of him walking in and clocking in like that. He still tried to sue for wrongful termination. Now, the, co the corporate lawyers very simply put down a copy of the dress code, put down the copy he signed, and showed the photos of him violating dress code three days in a row. He lost. But in his mind, I'll sign it, but I don't have to obey it. 
And he firmly believed that to the point of trying to sue for wrongful termination when he violated a contract he signed. And I hired people for this company. Every manager that hired someone for this company was very, very clear. We went over the dress code. We went over the corporate store where you could buy these things cheaper than Walmart. He didn't care. It was at that same store I had someone who came in, handed me a $100 bill with George Washington's face on it, trying to buy a pack of gum and get change. I put the $100 bill in the Dropbox and I said, uh, no, that's a fake $100 bill. No, man, I just got that from the bank. So I opened the Dropbox and I pulled out that $100 bill. And I said, you got, a, you got a $1 bill in your wallet? Well, yeah, pull it out and look at it. Who's on the, whose picture's on it? Well, it's George Washington, man. Same as on here. I can see the tape. I locked it back up. I have to call the police now, and I have your I have you on video, so you can expect him to call you. Dude Rabbit is still holding the 35-cent pack of gum, which I didn't care about. Police showed up. Secret Service was called because it was counterfeiting. But he actually tried to defend that he had cut the edges off a $100 bill, taped them onto the edges of a one, and tried to say, no, man, that's real. you got to give me change. Willful, conscious ambivalence. It's going to be the downfall of a lot of people. It's going to be the downfall of society if we don't curb it. For those who've watched Idiocracy, it's pretty much the crux of that entire movie. You have an entire society that anyone who sound, who speaks the way I'm speaking is insulted, called a fag, is assaulted, is chased away because they sound different. The world is so set because when you look at it, people will actually, when police knock at the door, no, you can't come in, man. I'm watching TV. We're, we're steamrolling. We're in a rocket-powered handcart to hell, and nobody wants to hit the brakes. And I honestly don't know what we're going to do about it. I mean, I've been ranting here for 23 minutes. It's, I, I'm going to stop. I'm going to go watch my TV shows and go to bed. i got to be at work in the morning, and i got to be there on time, or I'm going to lose my job. But I'd love to hear some, some comments. Why is it, what is it that fuels this attitude of, I'm always right, you're always wrong, because you said I'm wrong, you've now wronged me, and you owe me money, and you owe me things, and you owe me an apology for saying I'm wrong, and I get to assault you, and I get to put you in jail, and I get to control you. Where did this start, and how do we end it? Because, honestly, that's going to be a question we got to answer very soon. I, I just, I don't know if we'll answer it in time. But that's really it. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Um, my voice is already, you can probably hear it's a little scratchy. It's al allergy season. It's Texas. It's allergy season 50 weeks a year and those other two weeks are spread up in a day at a time here and there but i'm gonna st i am working on a few ideas i'm working on them the way i work on lesson plans for class uh it, i'm not going to put together just an, an idea on paper and then rant about it i want an outline i want my source materials i want everything the way i would teach a class and a lot of it is going to be history there will be some sociology, psychology, geography, economics, all of that brought in. But it's mostly history, and it's because I look at young people today and what they've been taught in public school, and I almost cringe because they're not taught real history. So I'm going to start putting together some stuff like that. So make sure you subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you're notified when things pop up. I'm not on a schedule right now. Uh, we're into a busier season at my office, so I don't have a lot of time. So uh, the videos will be sporadic for a little while longer, but they'll be coming, and you'll want to know. So like I said, make sure go on and subscribe and hit notifications so that you're told you're notified when everything pops up. Till next time, everybody have a great day.